Do you know how you turn this one on? Hello? Oh. I guess this thing is on. All right, well, as promised, I'm back, but just for a little bit. Um, again, my name is Mary Strau. I'm the Communications Director for the Washington Research Council. Uh, welcome again to our 84th annual dinner. We're very happy to have you all here this evening. Um, before we get started, I wanted to recognize all the elected officials, former and current, who have joined us this evening. Hopefully, I haven't forgotten anybody. Um, first of all, my former boss, former U.S. Senator Slade Gorton. Um, and we have two state senators with us this evening, Mark Schessler and Steve Lipsow. And we have also some state representatives with us this evening, Dan Griffey. All right. uh, Mark Harmsworth, is Mark here? All right, naughty Mark, you couldn't make it. Uh, Drew McEwen, all right. And Matt Manweller. All right, um, very briefly, for those of you who are not familiar with the uh, Washington Research Council, what we are and what we do, I'll give a brief introduction. Uh, the Research Council is the state's premier business-supported research organization. We examine how public policy issues will affect business, government, and the community. Our research is based on facts from reliable data sources and informed by economic analysis with an appreciation of the power of free markets. Um, we produce reports, policy briefs, and other publications, and also offer analysis via blog posts on our website, researchcouncil.org. Um, and also, starting about a year and a half ago, we now have podcasts. Uh, one's called Common Ground, one is Policy Today, another is In Focus, which you can access from our website. Um, so end of plug. Um, we are very uh, happy this evening to have Morton Kondracki, and I'm sure he will have a very informative and very entertaining uh, talk for us this evening. Um, one thing I wanted to note is that you'll notice index cards and pens on your table. Uh, if you have questions for Mr. Kondraki, you can write them down on the cards near the end of his remarks. We'll collect them and then um, as much as we can, we'll try to ask as many of those questions uh, as possible. Um, now I would like to introduce the chairman of the board of the Research Council, Mr. Eric Strom. Well, you can see how esteemed I am because I'm in the back. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. Only took me five minutes to get up. No, no, it's great to have you all here. Thanks so much for coming out for another great event. And uh, for those of you that this is your first time, we welcome you. Um, maybe this is the first time you've heard about the Washington Research Council. Uh, we're the quiet company. No, we are actually a very important organization down in Olympia and in the state. And as Mary said, really providing a lot of important research uh, that can help our policymakers make the right decisions, hopefully. So uh, we thank you for your support. For all of the companies here, thank you for participating. Thank you for many longstanding relationships that have been formed through this organization. Um, on that note, there's a lot of you that are former boards of directors of this organization. If you wouldn't mind just standing and so we can recognize you and thank you, those are former Washington Research Council folks. Thank you, thank you. Always Mr. McNaughton. <laughs> Thank you. And how about the current uh, Research Council uh, directors, if you would mind standing really quick so we can recognize you. Thank you. We appreciate your service, and uh, thank you again for joining us. Uh, also to Senator Gordon, thank you, wherever you are, right here. Thank you for joining us again today. We appreciate your leadership throughout the years. For those of you who don't know, there was a great recognition of the senator this last Thursday by the Seattle Mariners for all the work that he's done 
uh, in many areas that is longstanding, but one of the things is saving the Mariners. By the way, they won tonight, seven to two. So, <laughs> yep. So we're thankful for that and what a year it's going to be, we hope. So anyways, have a wonderful time tonight, and we're excited to have Mr. Kondaki here with us. And uh, again, we just look forward to uh, having you participate not only tonight, but in the years to come. So thanks again. I'm going to turn it over to Lou Moore, our executive director. And uh, Lou, am I forgetting anything else? OK. He's, he had that look like I did. So I'm sure he's actually got something. So here he comes, Lou Moore. As I'm walking down, I remember there is one important person. Dick Davies is also here, and his wife, Elaine, the former executive director. I want to recognize them, too. Thank you, Thank you Dick. Here's Lou. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. This is a great turnout. It's exciting. And I want to particularly thank uh, those who have uh, sponsored this event tonight. First of all, the Washington Roundtable for sponsoring uh, the bar uh, prior to this. Appears to be rather popular. Uh, but I want to thank our platinum sponsors. Absolutely. These folks really stepped up, and as uh, many of them have year after year. But the Association of Washington Business, the Boeing Company, the Microsoft Corporation, Primera Blue Cross, Puget Sound Energy, and the Washington Retail Association, thank you so much for your help. And we also want to recognize our gold sponsors, who this year are uh, Pemco Mutual Insurance Company and uh, British Petroleum, BP. Our silver sponsors, Alaska Airlines, BNSF Railway, Green Diamond Resource Company, Liberty Mutual Insurance, Physicians Insurance, A Mutual, uh, a mutual Company, uh, and Russell Investments, even though they're sitting in the back. And, uh, uh, we also want to thank Amazon.com at the bronze level, Amazon.com, the Avista Corporation, CNA Insurance Companies, Lane Powell, and uh, again, the Washington Roundtable. Thank you so much for your help. So I, I want to recognize the folks that like do research, because that's why you're here tonight. And uh, they're all here tonight, kind of shocking. But uh, Mary is our MC, and uh, she joined us last year as a communications director and as a research analyst. And uh, we have some other folks here that do research as well. Uh, Emily Makings, our senior research analyst, is here tonight. Uh, we also have uh, the esteemed Dee Dee McConnell, who put all this together, who gets uh, credit for this coming off tonight as well as the heart and backbone of the Research Council, Dr. Chris Schoblut is here tonight as well. So I just have a few things to say before we get to our guest, uh, who we're very excited about having. Um, so we have some exciting projects going on at the Research Council. Mary mentioned podcasts, and she mentioned our Common Ground podcast, where we uh, bring people together including uh, our friend Randy abrams Karras, who's also here tonight. Thank you, Randy. Who have uh, different points of view, sometimes not the same points of view that folks in business have, but we think it's important to bring people together around verifiable information, to try to come up in a constructive way with solutions to a lot of the vexing, terrible problems that we are dealing with right now, as well as to dispel uh, misinformation about things like taxation in this state. So uh, we've been very involved with that, uh, the podcasting program, but uh, we haven't lost sight of our primary mission, which is doing research. We've got some exciting projects going on right now. We're digging, digging deep into the uh, McCleary situation and the potential fiscal impacts uh, that it's going to have on the state. We're going to look at taxes and tax incentives and uh, state competitiveness. We're going to be coming up with some information that may be surprising to some people, but is factual as far as the reality of life, which is Washington State is competing with 49 other states for business, for jobs, uh, for economic uh, prosperity. And uh, we're, we're, uh, we've moved into the land use area. We're uh, doing uh, research on that. And we're, this year, we're also going to move into the health care 
uh, area with our research. Uh, we're going to continue with government reform. We did a major report last year. We're going to talk more about that. And uh, we're going to continue as we're able with our uh, mighty group to uh, look more at local governments, county level governments, and, and not just have our focus at the state level. But uh, so that's what we're up to. And uh, but at the end of the day, in the tumult of what's going on uh, in the country right now, which uh, our guests will be talking about, one part of that, what's going on in this state, it is just so critical to bring information into the public arena that is the truth, that is the best information that they can get, that is not biased, except for a bias that we do want people to have jobs, we want to have prosperity in this state. We're not ashamed of that. We're not ashamed. Uh, I mean, we're very happy that people are in business in this state. We'd like to see more of them in business and them all be more successful. But, uh, but that being said, uh, there is not an agenda other than that, other than providing the best information we can for the folks that support us and for the general public. Uh, so uh, with that, this has been a very interesting year in the world of politics that will be affecting the world of policy, maybe in some cataclysmic ways, I'm not quite sure, uh, next year. And uh, so that brings us to our guest for this evening. Morton Kondracki is a national figure of longstanding, an iconic figure uh, in the, on the McLaughlin Group. Uh, they had a show called The Beltway Boys for a while that I used to watch. Uh, he has been a national commentator, policy analyst uh, figure uh, in that arena for many, many years. And we're very grateful to have him. He's also one of us he, uh, because he lives on Bainbridge Island. But, uh, uh, and I think, uh, I don't want to go too far here, but I think it's fair to say that his wife is one of us because she is an advocate for charter schools. Which, uh, In 2006, Mr. Kondracki won the Washington Post Crystal Ball Tournament of Champions Award for correctly predicting the Democratic takeover of Congress, outpacing 10 other previous Crystal Ball winners. And uh, he's, he's authored a book that I strongly encourage you to read. Uh, I'm reading it right now about somebody who I greatly have greatly respected and just had a little bit of an opportunity to interact with years ago, uh, the great Jack Kemp. And regardless of, of your party affiliation or your ideological moorings, we need people that have the positive vision and the lack of maliciousness that Jack Kemp had. I, and I, I think that's part of the formula for improving the situation in this country. And, and so uh, uh, Mark did the, uh, wrote this book with Fred Barnes. It's a great read. It's here. He's here. He can sign it. Please buy that book. And uh, he's also written a couple uh, of path-breaking uh, op-eds uh, fairly recently in the Washington Post, one on what could be the makings of a moderate political movement in the country, and another one talking about the benefits of global trade, which has come under a little bit of controversy recently. So we're really excited to have him. Please uh, give a very warm welcome to Morton Kondracki. Thank you, Lou. <coughs> My wife, Marguerite, is here. She is a charter school um, uh, board member uh, for Green Dot. And my son, uh, Jim Moorhead, is here, uh, who uh, is the uh, market executive for uh, commercial banking at Bank of America. Hope you all get to meet him. Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Um, uh, any of you who ever watched uh, the McLaughlin Group or Fox News, Will, will understand that I'm not, not only glad to be here, I'm glad to be anywhere where I can finish a sentence without getting interrupted. <laughs> um, uh, Marguerite said that I should uh, do, do a, uh, a warning to you, a, uh, uh, an alert that uh, if you're for Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders, you probably will not like what I'm going to say tonight. <laughs> um, so uh, thank you for what you do. Um, 
you know, providing citizens and politicians and businesses with in-depth analysis uh, of um, the, the effects of public policy on, on the Washington economy is really important, and I'm, and I'm grateful to you for doing it. And thank you for letting me um, talk about my book and maybe sell some uh, outside when, when we're done, as well as talk about the main subject, uh, this miserable and depressing, and as I say in the title of the, of the um, speech, perilous uh, election. Uh, Jack Kemp, although he died in 2009, is actually relevant to 2016 uh, for, for one reason, because Paul Ryan, the Speaker of the House, um, uh, um, regards Jack Kemp as his mentor uh, and is trying to position the Republican Party, as he says, as the party of Lincoln, Reagan, and Kemp, uh, hard as that may be in the, uh, uh, given the ascendancy of Donald Trump. Um, Kemp said that the purpose of politics was not simply to win elections, but to deserve to win elections by producing better ideas than the opposition for making uh, life better for ordinary Americans. Uh, he was a dedicated free market conservative, uh, but he was also optimistic and idealistic and compassionate and growth oriented. Uh, he was pro-civil rights. Um, he was a free trader and an immigration reformer. He was incapable of negative campaigning, um, even when he should have done some. Um, he was incapable of, per of personal insults, um, which I think explains Paul Ryan's problems endorsing Donald Trump. Um, Kemp also uh, is especially relevant because in 1979, he correctly diagnosed a truth about American politics that is playing out savagely uh, in 2016. Um, he said, quote, in a stagnant or contracting economy, politics becomes the business of pitting class against class, rich against poor, white against black, capital against labor, sunbelt against snowbelt, old against young. Uh, he was speaking in the dismal 1970s, which was the era of high inflation, um, high unemployment, stagflation it was called, um, gas lines, misery index, Malays, and also Soviet advances in Afghanistan and Africa and, and Latin America. All of which uh, Reagan, Ronald Reagan reversed uh, using, um, uh, during the 1980s, using tax cut and tax reform ideas uh, developed by Jack Kemp. Um, after a deep recession, 1982-83, induced by Paul Volcker to tame inflation, the economy boomed practically for 20 years, uh, and it made it possible for Reagan to afford the defense buildup, uh, which uh, stressed the Soviet Union to the breaking point. So uh, in 1989, when the Berlin Wall actually came down, um, uh, most of the world thought that American-style democratic liberal capitalism was the quote-unquote end of history. America's morale was revived. Uh, in 1979, only 12% of Americans thought that the country was on the right track. <clears throat> in 1986, it was 69%. Uh, it was Ronald Reagan who did it, uh, but Jack Kemp gave him the, uh, the policy equipment with which he did it, um, all of which led Fred Barnes and, and me to say, uh, in what I thought would be a highly controversial first sentence of the book, um, that Jack Kemp was the most important politician of the 20th century who was not president, certainly the most influential Republican. Um, and you can read the book and see if you agree. Um, <clears throat> but you won't be able to dispute it because I probably won't be there. I'll be on Bainbridge Island. Uh, in any event, that was now. Um, uh, that was then. I mean, um, now we're in an era of economic and geopolitical challenge and political challenge as great or greater than we were in the 1970s. It's a perilous time. It's a perilous election. The next president is going to have to cope with threats from an aggressive Russia and aggressive China, both of which you would certainly call rivals. Uh, they may develop into adversaries. They may even develop into enemies. Uh, the next president faces definite adversaries in Iran and North Korea. Uh, and Islamic terrorist, terrorist groups 
uh, capitalizing on epic and probably chronic chaos in the, in the Middle East, um, and increasingly capable of, of staging attacks in Europe and perhaps the, and even the United States. Um, and the next president is going to have to take on mounting threats from cyber warfare and nuclear proliferation. Uh, the next president also faces a weakening world economy and the possible breakup of the European Union, uh, or at least a Europe preoccupied with a refugee crisis that's boosting right-wing nationalist figures in France, in Denmark, in Poland, in Hungary, and Sweden. Uh, the world is not so convinced anymore that American-style dem democracy uh, and capitalism is the way to go. Authoritarianism um, is, is, is on the rise. Um, and even in the United States, uh, Harvard uh, University uh, Institute of Politics poll showed that only 19% of voters aged 18 to 34 identified themselves as capitalists, 19%. And only 42% said that they supported capitalism. Uh, fortunately, the support for socialism was lower, 33%, but that, not that much lower. Um, you'll be glad to know that uh, capitalism is still supported by a majority of adults over 35. But the kids don't get it, um, and it, as evidenced by the support that, um, that Bernie Sanders is showing. So uh, uh, among all groups in, in society, there's this vast dissatisfaction, even anger and rage with the direction of the country and certainly with the federal government. Um, only 25 to 30 percent of the population, depending on which poll you look at, are satisfied with the way things are going. Confidence in practically every institution except the military and small business is at the lowest level that it's been since Gallup has been polling on the subject. Only 21 percent have confidence in big business and TV news, 33 um, percent in the presidency, and 8 percent in Congress. Um, nobody can quite figure out who those 8 percent are. Um, <clears throat> uh, John McCain says it, it, uh, it must be close relatives and paid staff. Uh, <laughs> Um, only 19 uh, percent trust the government in Washington to do the right thing most of the time. 57 percent uh, of the population said they're, say they're frustrated with Washington, and 22 percent say they're angry with Washington. Uh, 70, 74 percent of Americans think that uh, elected officials put their own interests ahead of the public's and don't care about what ordinary people think. As in the 1970s, economic growth is glacial. Um, the average growth rate from the, the end of World War II to 2000 was 3.6%. Um, since, the, since the Great Recession ended, it's been only 2.4%. And before that, under George W. Bush, in non-recession years, it was, it was only 2.6%. So slow growth is, a, is, is becoming chronic. Um, the official unemployment rate has fallen from 10% in 2009 to 5%, but the U6 rate counting underemployment is still, is still at 10%. Um, and um, uh, and the, the labor force participation rate is still below what it was before the Great Recession. Um, most relevant of all, med median household incomes, uh, median household income is the same as it was in 1996, and it's below what it was in 2007. Uh, average hourly pay in, uh, in, um, in 1965 was $19.79. In 2014, um, it was $21.04, hardly increased at all. And among white men aged 45 to 54, uh, earnings are 7% below what they were in 1987. Uh, in the meantime, health care costs have soared far beyond the rate of, in, of, of income increases, so have college costs. And despite a, despite a progressive income tax and in spite of uh, income transfers of, from, uh, from, the, from the government, the middle class is shrinking, uh, the rich are getting richer, the poor are stuck. Um, a Pew Research analysis last year showed that the wealth of the top 20% of households in America has doubled since 1983 
the middle, for the middle 50% of the population, it's increased by 70%. For the poor, it's below what it was in 1983. The top 0.1% of families held 7% of America's wealth in the late 1970s. Now it's 22%. Um, the richest 10% of Americans own 76% of all the wealth in America. Um, Maybe the most distressing number, poll numbers of all, are, uh, are indications of pessimism among the American people. Uh, we're back to sort of a 70s mentality. Only 21% of, of Americans think that the next generation of Americans will have a better life than this generation. 76% are not confident. Uh, and so uh, we see in this election year what um, what Jack Kemp was talking about in the 70s. Uh, politics is a massive blame game. Uh, it's, it's all about scapegoating. Uh, Donald Trump is blaming Mexican immigrants, who he calls rapists and drug dealers. Um, he's blaming stupid politicians of both parties who have made terrible trade deals, allowing China again to rape us, he says, and Mexico and Japan to steal our jobs. He's also blaming our allies in Europe, Saudi Arabia, Japan, and South Korea for sapping our economy to pay for their defense. America, he says, is losing, 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 uh, but uh, he's gonna see to it that we win, win, win. Um, uh, and indeed, uh, when he won the Nevada uh, election, he said, we're gonna get greedy for the United States. We're going to grab and grab and grab and grab. We're going to bring so much money and so much everything back to the United States. It'll be wonderful. Uh, at that rally, of course, he said, we're going to make America great again. And the crowd leapt to his feet and, and cheered. Then we have Bernie Sanders and the left. They blame trade agreements, too. Um, they blame corporate greed. They blame millionaires and billionaires who are buying the government policies that they want. Um, he adds that uh, the business model of Wall Street is fraud. Um, all the Republican candidates blame Barack Obama for whatever is wrong in the country, and, um, the, uh, and the Hillary Clinton and Bernie blame obstructionist Republicans who resisted every effort by Obama to help the middle class. Uh, in both parties, the establishment is the enemy. Outsiders are in. Populism is ascendant. Uh, there's a Pew poll that shows that by 76 to 19, people think that the government favors a few big interests, not the population at large. Uh, unfortunately for her, Hillary Clinton is the ultimate insider, the ultimate establishmentarian, uh, even though she's trying her best to accommodate her agenda to the Bernie Sanders um, uh, um, wing of the party. So I have my own favorite scapegoat. Um, and I think it may be shared by a lot of you, and it is the polarized political system uh, in Washington that um, produces constant tribal warfare and does nothing uh, to solve any of America's true problems. Uh, close to $20 trillion in debt, the crumbling infrastructure, a broken immigration system, uh, by world standards, a second-rate or maybe third-rate education system, slow growth, and a stalled upward mobility system. Um, now, there, there is some merit in the blame casting. Uh, globalization and trade agreements, do lower, they lower the cost of what we consume. They provide us with better products than, than we could produce ourselves by, by importing, but they do cost manufacturing jobs. Illegal immigration, especially the exploitation of illegal immigrants, probably does lower the wages of low-income workers. Uh, our NATO allies and others don't devote what they're supposed to uh, to the common defense. On the Bernie Sanders side, I invite you to read a new book called Makers and Takers. And if you don't want to read the whole thing, you can just look at the, at the cover story in this week's Time magazine. The argument is that financialization of the US economy is what is slowing growth and uh, producing income inequality. That is, the tendency of businesses to, to make money trading and keeping their share prices high as opposed to investing and producing things. 
Financial institutions now account for 25% of all corporate profits, although they account for only 4% of the jobs in America. So there's no question that neither party in Washington has done anything significant to help the struggling working class. Uh, President Obama admitted the other day in the New York Times that uh, when the Democrats had full control of Congress, um, basically the, the only thing he got done was Obamacare, whereas he should have tried to establish a national infrastructure bank, which would have been public and private, could have attracted money that is sitting in, in corporate bank accounts and put it into the, into the economy, uh, built roads and water systems that we need in airports, uh, and also created good jobs. Um, Republicans have had control of Congress since 2011, uh, but they've done nothing but fight amongst themselves to see how much they could cut down or maybe shut down the government. Um, they've talked about replacing Obamacare with something better. They haven't produced a bill. Uh, they've talked about report, re reforming the tax system. They haven't produced a bill. They've talked about controlling college costs. They haven't produced a bill. Uh, a K-12 to education bill has passed the Congress thanks to uh, cooperation between Patty Murray and Lamar Alexander, but it is not going to raise uh, the standards of American education, which now rank 26th in the world in math and science. Uh, amendments were defeated in the process of producing that bill that would have expanded school choice, uh, creating competition with the regular public schools that so often fail their students. Um, choice is anathema to the teachers unions, as evidenced by their war against charter schools, um, including in, in, in Washington State. Um, the bill to keep the charter schools in Washington State alive passed the legislature and Governor Inslee let it pass into law with, without his signature, but you can be very sure that the teachers unions will be back in court in order to try to, to upend it. Um, so the fight, the fight goes on. And I think, and I'm sure that you agree, that giving American kids a first-rate, world-class education is the best way to equip the next generation to deal with global high-tech competition. Uh, if we don't educate them well, they're not going to be able to compete. We're not doing it. Uh, in fact, um, the opposition to the Common Core standards, which are world-class standards, is bipartisan now. The Tea Party is against it because they think it's something imposed by Washington, when in fact it was invented by the, by the state governors. And the Democrats are against it because uh, the teachers unions are against it. Um, Congress has done nothing to help workers who have already lost their jobs because of globalization and, and technology, uh, like establish a first-rate vocational education system, which we don't have, establish some sort of wage insurance plan, create German-style apprenticeship programs, uh, perhaps have a sliding scale of lowering payroll taxes for for uh, low-income workers and maybe pay for it by raising the income cap on Social Security taxes. So voters have every reason to be f perfectly furious at the establishment uh, and Washington and, and want to shake up the system. Um, Jack Kemp in his time shook up the system too, uh, but he did it with constructive ideas. Um, this campaign has produced hardly any. It has produced some. Uh, Trump to his credit, has a tax reform plan that would lower corporate tax rates, uh, which are now the second highest in the world. Uh, but he would also, it, his tax plan, or proposal, as he now calls it, just a proposal, um, would, the estimate is, cost, uh, add $10 trillion to the debt, to the, to the debt uh, and mainly cut taxes for the wealthy, even though he says he's all about helping the middle class. Uh, both Hill he and Hillary want to spend a lot of money on infrastructure. Uh, he hasn't said how much uh, or how he'd pay for it. Um, she wants to raise corporate taxes, um, and both of them want to pub punish corporations um, that move offshore because of high corporate tax rates in the United States. Uh, when I look at the major proposals of the three remaining candidates, and the character and leadership styles 
of the two probable finalists, all I see ahead is disaster. Donald Trump is an egomaniac. He's a bully. He's a xenophobe. He's a misogynist. He's a nativist. He's a racist. He's a conspiratorialist. He's a liar. And he's a demagogue. And if anybody has any quarrel with any of that, uh, see me afterwards and I can give you chapter and verse out of his own mouth, right? A potty mouth, I might add, um, um, which demeans the dignity of the, of the presidency of the United States. Uh, I will give him the fact that he is a talented de demagogue uh, who, who has given voice to the rage felt by working class whites, but largely by demonizing others, off, often falsely. He's brilliantly dominated the media with tweets. Um, I, you know, I didn't think you could do with tweets what Donald Trump has done, but he's done it. Uh, he's demolished his opponents with nifty put downs. Um, and he's used his skill as a you're fired uh, reality show uh, showman to, uh, to dominate can candidate debates. Uh, the historian Robert Kagan wrote the other day that what Trump offers is, quote, an aura of crude strength and machismo playing on feelings of resentment and disdain interming intermingled with bits of fear, hatred, and anger. That's Trump. Uh, he's, the, he's the tough guy. Um, he's the strong man who's going to put his followers on top again. But he has zero experience working in foreign policy or domestic policy, uh, and he's, he's put forward practically no policy proposals uh, that you can analyze except, believe me, believe me, we're going to be great. Everything's going to be great. Um, he's promised to build a great wall between the United States and Mexico uh, and make the Mexicans pay for it, apparently by blocking remittances to Mexico or threatening to block remittances to Mexico. The wall is going to clog all commerce between the United States and Mexico. Blocking remittances would involve the government's opening all mail headed to Mexico, monitoring Western Union transfers, blocking bank transfers. That sounds like NSA intrusion to the max, violations of civil liberties. Uh, he's going to expel 11 million illegals, men, women, and children, which would requ require a massive police action uh, and make for the ugliest ethnic cleansing operation that America has seen since Andrew Jackson drove the Indian tribes out of the East to the reservations in the West. If anybody criticizes what Donald Trump says, he's going to change the libel laws to make it possible for a public employee to sue um, uh, for libel, um, which is a violation of what we now understand to be the First Amendment. Uh, if a corporation is thinking about moving offshore because of corporate, high corporate tax rates, um, incidentally, his brand name ties are made in China. Um, when he built, uh, when he built his, his um, uh, Mar-a-Lago estate, uh, he used 98% imported labor, not Americans. Nonetheless, um, if a corporation wants to move offshore, uh, put a plant offshore, he's going to threaten the CEO with unspecified reprisals. Um, he evidently wants to renegotiate all of our trade agreements uh, using his leverage threats to raise tariffs. Um, that may, be, may work in real estate, um, uh, but uh, he seems not to have considered the possibility that he might set off a trade war which would um, throw the economy in a world into a depression, world economy. Uh, it's happened before, called Smoot-Hawley. Uh, he suggested discounting the national debt. Uh, in other words, paying our creditors only part of what we owe them. Um, and the record shows that he often does that in real estate transactions. He either pays late uh, or doesn't pay at all or gets into, involved in litigation and drags it out, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but uh, if he did it with the, United, the debt of the United States, it would destroy the full faith and credit of, of, of the country and have disastrous consequences for, uh, for, the, for the, the whole world economy. Alternative, he say, uh, alternatively, he says, well, we can pay off the debt by printing money. We do that. Um, but, um, you know, he seems not, it, and inflation is not at the moment a problem, but if you print enough money, 
believe me, inflation will, will be a problem. Um, I don't think he's going to really ban all Muslims uh, from the United States. He'll probably let in oil barons and, and diplomats and um, uh, kings and princes. Uh, but um, he, is, he does say that he's going to step up surveillance of mosques and Muslim communities. Muslims, by the way, American Muslims, regard, self-identify as Americans at the same rate as Presbyterians do. Um, various experts, including D uh, David Petraeus, say that his policies and, rec and rhetoric are actually helping ISIS um, by discouraging cooperation and identifying radicals uh, and making it seem that the United States really is at war with all of Islam. Yes, ISIS, if it agrees with this analysis, might just stage an attack uh, before the, the, the coming election and thereby elect Donald Trump as president. Um, he's threatened to reinstitute waterboarding and worse, kill the families of terrorists. Uh, but the, uh, unfortunately for him, the United States military won't go along with what it regards as war crimes. He says he's not going to just balance the budget, but he's going to pay off the national debt in eight years, $19 trillion. But he's not going to trim entitlement benefits. He is going to spend a lot more money on defense. His tax plan will add $10 trillion to the national debt. Uh, and it's all possible, he says, because he's going to bring all those jobs back home, and he's going to make the economy grow like you've never seen it grow before. And he says he'll cut weight, waste, fraud, and abuse. So the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, which is a bipartisan research organization much like yours, um, says that in order to, to pay off the national debt, he would have to produce a growth rate of 16.1%. Remind you that the average since the end of World War II has been 3.7%, and it's now 2.4%. Or um, he would have to cut domestic spending by 97% uh, in order to do that. Uh, in, in, in reality, the, the committee figures that he's really going to double the national debt uh, over the next 10 years. He's declared that NATO is obsolete, uh, that he, he seems to think that he can make, uh, make friends with Vladimir Putin. They have a mutual admiration society going, um, even though Putin murders his critics and uh, menaces our Eastern, uh, Eastern European allies. Uh, he's going to demand that our allies pay up if, uh, if they want to keep US troops uh, on their soil, or we're going to walk. Um, yet he criticizes Obama for running a pitifully weak foreign policy and for abandoning our allies, which he actually has done. I could go on and on. I will. <laughs> so he's going to renounce Obama's Iran nuclear deal, but he hasn't said how he's going to keep Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. Um, he says it's OK, even inevitable, that Saudi Arabia and Japan and South Korea will get nuclear weapons, even though he says that nuclear proliferation is the greatest problem facing the world. And if the, those that we protect with our nuclear umbrella want to keep the umbrella up, they're going to have to pay us. How much? It's unclear. I'm done with t Donald Trump for the moment. <laughs> <laughs> then we have Hillary Clinton, um, who says that the answer to practically every problem is a big new federal program and higher taxes. Um, some of her proposals actually, I think, are salutary. Um, reducing the debt load on students at public colleges not making them free, just reducing their debt load, um, expanding early childhood education. That's probably the best investment the country could possibly make in the future productivity of American kids. Um, she wants to establish a national infrastructure bank. She wants to guarantee workers and their families 12 weeks of paid medical leave. She wants to expand scientific research. I don't see anything wrong with any of those. But she's also going to expand Obamacare with all of its mandates uh, instead of establishing some sort of a market-based system. And my guess is that the more Bernie Sanders pushes on her, the closer she will come to a single-payer uh, system. You can be sure that the infrastructure that she wants to build will be as expensive as it can possibly be by paying prevailing union wages on all, on all the work. Um, she's come out against charter schools because she's um, um, won the endorsement of the teachers' unions. 
uh, to appease the Ber Bernie voters. She's come out against the Trans-Pacific um, Partnership Trade Agreement and the XL um, pipeline. Um, and you can be sure that all the minute regulations and complicated regulations that the Obama administration has placed on American business will be continued and probably multiplied. Um, and then we have her character problems. The email server, uh, which seems to have been designed to uh, give her control over what she did in the State Department that, that ends up in the public record. Um, she has a long-standing penchant for secrecy, as was evidenced by her um, task force uh, that developed Hillary Care uh, back in the, in, in the 1990s, totally done in secret, didn't pass. Um, everybody who knows, everybody I, ever, I know who has ever worked in the federal government says that the email server is totally against government regulations and may, and may indeed be Ill illegal. Uh, whether she'll ever be prosecuted probably depends on whether the prosecutors think that they can prove criminal intent on her, on her part, or she may not be prosecuted because of the fact that we have a Democratic administration and they don't want to do it. Um, uh, then there's the Clinton Foundation. There's a book called Clinton Cash, which was followed up on by the Washington Post and, and the New York Times um, that details innumerable apparent conflicts of interest between contributions made to the Clinton Foundation and honoraria paid to Bill Clinton while Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State. Uh, the most problematic in my, in my mind was a $235 million um, contribution, I'm sorry, a $2.35 million contribution to the foundation and a $500,000 speech fee to Bill uh, by a, the chairman of a Canadian uranium company, um, which got State Department permission to make a sale that gave Russia control of a fifth of the uranium production in the United States. Um, the Clintons, as has often been observed, do not believe that they are required to follow the same rules as everybody else. Um, uh, now, there's a long record of Donald Trump's also exploiting the system, bankruptcy, tax dodging, lawsuits, threats of lawsuits to advance his business interests, but his supporters seem to love that. Um, um, so th there's a whole, then there's the whole record dating back into Arkansas and the, and the White House, which I need not go into, all of which will be lovingly explored by, by Donald Trump. Um, um, he's, um, you know, he's already started on Hillary's record in blackening the reputation of women who alleged sexual mistreatment by, by Bill. We will hear lots and lots more of that. Then we have Bernie Sanders, third choice, um, um, who seems unlikely to be nominated, but is going to have a powerful influence as we go forward on democratic policy and the platform. It's going to be a revolution, really the Scandinavianization of the, of the United States. Um, federal spending, which averages 24.5% of GDP, is going to go to 30 or 35% of GDP. Um, revenue, tax revenues would go from 17.4% of GDP to 25% of GDP. Um, the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget estimates that he will add between $2 trillion and $15 trillion to the debt, depending on how you calculate uh, the cost of universal health care, um, and so on. He wants to expand Social Security benefits even for the wealthy by raising the cap on payroll taxes. Um, He'd establish a Canadian-style single-payer um, health care system paid for by raising the top rate, um, income tax rate, to 52 percent and taxing capital gains as ordinary income, and so on. Um, so um, it's a dismal choice that, that, that Americans face. And I've, I've explained, in part, how we got there. It's the rage of, at the government, at the establishment, fear that the American dream is dying. Um, there are some other factors. I think one of them is the coarsening of discourse and behavior of, in America. Um, I, I remember being shocked the first time I heard the word, 
the, the expression pissed off on television. I thought, wow, this is really a decline of standards. I mean, now it's everyday conversation, right? Um, now, um, now it's okay for Trump to say in public, we're gonna bomb the shit out of um, ISIS, or he used the F word to denounce the former president of, of Mexico, who said we're not, you know, we're not gonna stand for the wall, or he's gonna, you know, he'd like to punch protesters at, at his rallies. Uh, we live in a cable TV culture. Um, it's full frontal nudity and the F word on HBO. Um, it's nonstop rancor on Fox News, on MSNBC, on the McLaughlin Group. Uh, on, I, I like to say I was an original on the McLaughlin Group. I was present at the beginning of the end of civil discourse in America. <laughs> I, I apologize. I didn't, I didn't know at the time what I was getting us into. Uh, and all, then there's talk radio. Trump was ahead of his time. Um, the, 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 the stuff that you will hear from the Clinton campaign, if you've not heard it already, of Trump talking to Howard Stern um, is X-rated. Uh, that, was, that was back in the 70s and 80s, so he was, he, he was ahead of his time. Um, now, another factor. The liberal scholar Robert Putnam and the conservative Charles Murray have both written books describing a loss of social capital among, among the American white working class with rates of out-of-wedlock birth, marriage breakup, failure to finish school, drug dependency, dropping out of the workforce, approaching the levels that we used to associate with the black underclass. Um, it's an audience that doesn't mind appeals to beat people up at, at, at rallies and who will cheer when, um, when a potential president mocks somebody who's disabled. Um, another factor, there's a nostalgia for an America that no longer exists, where whites were the dominant majority and minorities and also women uh, knew their place. Um, um, our education is, system has produced a population that's ignorant of economics, hence the acceptance of Bernie's everything's gonna be free policies uh, as if no one has to pay the bill. Um, the media has a part in this. It's been obsessed with the horse race, it's been hungry for ratings and sensations, um, hence the almost complete failure to concentrate um, on whether the candidate's ideas make any sense. Um, so with that depressing prelude, you'll wanna know who's gonna win. Um, well, uh, um, as was mentioned, um, you know, you are in the presence of a seer. Uh, I, I not, o not only did I win the, the uh, Crystal Ball Tournament of Champions Award, I was a champion, right? I wouldn't have been in that contest had I not previously been a champion. So I've won it, I, I won it twice. Um, then for some reason, um, um, this year, my crystal ball has developed cataracts. Um, so the conventional wisdom has been that um, given his astronomical unfavorability ratings, especially with minorities, women, and young people, that Trump couldn't possibly win. Uh, on the other hand, Hillary Clinton has, is a terrible candidate uh, in this showbiz era. Um, she's a policy wonk. She's unexciting. She's conventional. She's establishment. She's stale. Uh, and she has her own sky-high unfavorability and untrustworthiness ratings. Um, in one poll that's just out today, her unfavorable ratings are higher than Trump's. Uh, the real clear politics I, I assume that you all know that website. It's a go-to place for, for political stuff. Um, their, their average of, of the polls gives Clinton just a 3% lead over Donald Trump, only a 4% lead in Florida, a 3% lead in Ohio, a 2% lead in New Hampshire. Um, it was thought that the Republican Party was so fractured that Donald Trump would go into the, into the general election wounded. Now we look at the Democratic Party and we see that it's fracturing because Bernie Sanders is not gonna give up uh, until the very last minute and Trump is gonna help um, defections from the Democratic Party by saying that Bernie is not being treated fairly by the Democrats who are all in favor, but the Democratic establishment, which is all in favor of Hillary. So, and then Trump, of course, is gonna savage Hillary in, in, in every way he can, we're gonna see crooked Hillary this and crooked Hillary that. 
the Clinton campaign will probably call him Dangerous Donald, um, I would guess, and be just as savage in revisiting his misdeeds and his crudity and his outlandish views. So I think this is going to be the ugliest presidential campaign that any of us has ever seen, and it may go down as one of the ugliest in, in, in American history. Myself, uh, since we live in a deep blue state that Hillary, if Hillary doesn't carry Washington, she won't carry anything, right? Um, so our, our votes, in effect, don't count. So uh, my plan is to write in somebody. And I encourage any of you who are so fed up with the choices to do the same. I'm thinking of writing in Paul Ryan because he's Jack Kemp's uh, heir. Uh, but if he caves too fast to Donald Trump, I might write in John Kasich. Uh, something like that. But I'm going to make a statement. I'm, and I'm be able to tell my grandchildren I didn't vote for either one of those, those two. <laughs> Join me. Um, so in past times, America, no matter how deeply in trouble, and especially in times of trouble, has always blessedly uh, found a leader uh, who could take us out of the trouble. Um, Abraham Lincoln, Theodore and Franklin Roosevelt, Ronald Reagan. This time, I do not see such a leader emerging from this election. So I'm afraid uh, that my bottom line advice to you is to say prayers for the United States of America. Uh, I'm sorry to be so depressing, but maybe we can work together and make the state of Washington uh, the city on the hill, even if the city on the hill is not going to be Washington, D.C. So thank you very much for listening, and I will answer any questions you might have. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much. Um, Let's see here. Here's a question. Fred Barnes endorsed Donald Trump in the latest issue of the Weekly he Standard. Not. He did? I don't know. Did he? <laughs> well, it can only be because, <clears throat> I mean, his boss, Bill Kristol, is still searching the landscape for a third candidate, um, and he's not, not being terribly su successful. I'll have to call Fred tomorrow and chew him out. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. He lives in Virginia, though. He's got to make a choice, right? And given where Fred's coming from, he can't possibly vote for Hillary. So that, that explains it. OK. Um, to what degree are the news media responsible for the rise of Trump and Hillary's success by their failure to drill down on their policies and character? A lot. A lot. Um, you know, I think that Trump. Trump's, the outrages of, out of Trump's mouth come so thick and fast that you can hardly keep up with them. And, um, and, and the press is constantly chasing them. And I, think, I, don't, I don't think that the press is rooting for Trump, but, he, but, but it's like, it's like, um, uh, like crack. Um, you know, he provides them with, with, a, with doses of crack every single day through, through tweets. I mean, one more outrageous than the other. He dominates every news cycle. The ratings rise when Trump is on. Everybody wants Trump. Megyn Kelly, who was as, as insulted by Trump as anything she could possibly be, just started a new show on the Fox, regular Fox uh, broadcast channel and was sweetsy tootsy with him, right? Has totally made up because, because she wanted ratings for the show. Um, I, I think the press is less, the press is not responsible for Hillary's winning the, the Democratic nomination. Um, the press does not like Hillary. Hillary does not like the press. She is unavailable to the press. Um, she, uh, she, is, she is paranoid about the press. Um, she doesn't give very much information to the press. I think Bernie is the novelty. And I don't think necessarily they're rooting for Bernie, but Bernie's different, and Bernie's an outsider, and outsiders are in. And so they're giving him a lot of publicity. And I think they've helped swell. And, and you know, Bernie's appeal to young people is something that the press sort of fa fastens onto. And, 
likes to r report and stuff like that. I, I, the press is not in favor of Hillary. Now, when it's Hillary against Trump, my guess is that when Hillary makes a charge, she will, it will get through if she knows how to make it as pungently as he will make the charges against her. Uh, you know, the, the, I bet you that the 80 percent, wouldn't you say, Bob, of the reporters in Washington will end up voting for Hillary, uh, but they have not been a big help to her yet. Um, any thoughts on how a Clinton versus Trump race will affect down ballot races from U.S. Congress yeah, down yeah. to legislature? Um, well, the conventional wisdom was that this was going to be a wipeout, Goldwater style, and um, uh, one of Bob Mary's and my favorite uh, uh, political experts was saying that the, the incumbent Republicans in Congress were praying for Marco Rubio, uh, and they thought that Donald Trump would be an absolute catastrophe. I just don't think that's true anymore. I think Trump has just shaken up the entire um, uh, game, and nobody knows for sure. I, you know, in a way, each candidate is going to have to make up his or her own mind about how to handle Trump based on the demographics of their state. Um, and but I don't think that Trump's nomination means that the Congress is going to go Democratic anymore. Um, I would, I, I honestly, you know, I, I, I think it was really up for grabs, and I cannot tell you, you just got to watch state by state, poll by poll. I mean, for sure, the, Demo the Democrats are going to get Illinois, they'll probably get Wisconsin, but whether they get the five or six states that they need, um, I doubt, frankly. I think, I think the Republicans probably will hold the Congress. All right, well, thank you so much, okay, Mr. Kondracki. Okay, thank you. Um, more will be available afterwards to uh, sign books. There will be more of his books available for purchase. And if you, and, and if you want some uplift, read about Jack Kemp. <laughs> <laughs>